Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Zachary Flim. I'm a PhD student and I'm going to talk about my work, which is an aerosol climatology made with Nomad UV's channel. So first, I will give a little background on aerosol on Mars, because I don't think everyone is familiar with that. So on Mars, uh, we have three types of aerosols, which is H2O ice, CO2 ice, and dust. Usually, we find dust close to the surface in troposphere, and the prints of H2O, H2O ice cloud and H2O ice cloud are found at higher altitudes. It's important to study the aerosols because I, they have a big impact on the atmosphere. So, for example, this plot is from Fonge et al, where you can see the temperature profile versus the altitude. It's a simulation between when you have no dust in the atmosphere, a bit of dust, and more and more dust, and the dust storm. And you can see that, well, the more you have dust, the higher the temperature can increase. And when there is a dust storm, so a lot of dust, the, the temperature profile change a lot. So actually having information on the amount of dust and the vertical structure is really important for models. So that's why we are interested in them. So uh, aerosols on Mars, which include so dust and ice, have seasonal variation. And to study them, we use the solar longitude. So solar longitude is an angle between Mars, which is here, and the sun. So at zero degree, you are here in the beginning of northern spring. And after, when you're on the aphelion, so when the LS is at 70 degrees, it's when Mars is further away from the sun, so the temperature is very cold, and the atmosphere, of course, will be different. As opposed to that, you have perihelion, when the solar longitude is at 250 degrees, when Mars is very close to the sun, so the temperature is higher, which will give different dynamics. Also, to, the, to get information, one Martian year, so when you make a full revolution, is equal to two Earth years, so when we are talking about Martian years, it takes more time on Earth. So as an example, this is uh, the, a global dust storm that happened in two, 2001. So here's the brown arrow, which here, you are at the beginning, so at LS or 190, and the atmosphere is quite clear, as you can see, but just very quickly, the dust storm rise, and then that all the atmosphere is quite opaque. So red arrow, you are in the LS 220. So the atmosphere is much warmer, and as you can imagine, having all this dust present in the atmosphere to the point where you can't see the surface have a huge impact on the retrieval atmosphere and dynamics. And this happens so here in the perihelion when the atmosphere is quite warm, and this is quite an extreme case, but smaller ones happen every Martian years in the, during the perihelion season. When you are at aphelion, so when Mars is quite colder, here, so you are at the end of aphelion for LS 120 degree. You can, Mars lo looks more like this. So as you see, this cloud that are around the equator are ice cloud. You can create in the picture, but you can see also some CO2 ice that's present at the pole. All this uh, presence of ice are more present in the aphelion with colder, and it really depends on the season because you saw previously it was more dusty in the perihelion when it's warmer, and it's more cold during aphelion. So there is a lot of signal variation that we need to take into account in our observation. So the methodology I use in a, to derive the aerosol is an onion peeling one. This means that we take the atmosphere and we divide it in several layers. We have the sun here and our spacecraft. We take a spectra that go that take that is outside the atmosphere, so at 120 kilometer, when you consider the atmosphere clear in the UV, and we take one and go through the atmosphere. When we, di we divide this one uh, that goes through the atmosphere by the one outside of it, and to have a transmittance spectra, by doing this, we remove all the sun spectra and we only get what is absorbed by the atmosphere. When you are working on Mars and you are in the UV, actually there is only ozone that is absorbing at 250 nanometers, and you have also some ray scattering. So we remove that using a relative transfer code named azimut. So what will result is that the transmission is only affected by the background, which means the aerosols. So there is no molecular absorption, which is good for us. After that, I compute the optical depth, which is in red along the line of sight, just using the bell number low. And then I compute the extinction, which is the green point, as you see, which is basically the local absorption of optical depth. So when you remove optical depth and you and you consider the path for each layer you have. So this technique was already used by Vilke et al. in 2000, in 2012 on Venus, but it's also applied very well on Mars. And so with this, you can really have the vertical profile of aerosols in opacity at each altitude. 
So when you have the extinction, which is the beta here, you want to read this to we want to read this to the size of particles, which is of course depending on the cross section. So we use this formula with n is the number of our particle and c is the cross section. The cross section of those particles depend on several parameters. It depends on shape, as we learned from yesterday. But when you are working in solar occultation, which is what we are doing, we are only sensitive to forward scattering. And in this particular geometry, we are not sensitive to shape. So if you, we, we use simulation from spherical particle, irregular shape particle of cylindrical, the extinction you get is actually almost the same. So we use spherical, spherical, spherical shape because it's easy to compute and faster. But if we were to use more complex shape, it won't actually change any, anything. So that's why you use that. We are, so we are sensitive to shape, but we are sensitive to size. So we compute the cross section for different parameters for R effective going from 0 0.5 to 2 micron. And we fix the effective variance of so the effective at 0 0.1. The definition are from Hansen et al. Uh, which is a classic definition, the aerosols retrieval. And then after we compute all this cross-section for different uh, effective radius and effective variance, we use a least square algorithm to fit actually our extinction and choose the best one. So that's how we link between the extinction and the cross-section. So the cross-section that is the closest to our extinction is chosen as the best fit, so we derive the size. So maybe it's really more clear. So for example, in orange here, so this is a wavelength versus extinction. You have orange is the data from normal Jovis, and you can see you have quite a slope. And when, and then we compute the cross-section with the R effective of 0 0.15 and the V effective of 0 0.1, which is the blue, you see that the fit is quite good. So that's why we just, that's why we say that here, this spectra is due to a particle with a R effective of 0 0.15. And here is another example. So it was at 40 kilometers, which is quite high in the atmosphere, so you have smaller particles. But closer to the surface of so 25, it's a totally flat, so it's a larger particle. So you see that here we stop at 2 micron. Here's the fit, because actually, if you were to fit a particle of 3 micron or 4 micron, it would still be flat. So this is like, we know this is at least 2 micron or 1.5, but it could be higher. So this is the limit, our limit of sensitivity, but the fit is good. And so finally, for the composition, so the composition is meaning that you change the refractive indices, but in the UV visible, we, there is no difference between Martian ice and dust, actually, from the refractive indices point of view. So we assume that what we see is, we use the dust refractive indices in our work because we have to use one, but the ice actually won't make a big difference. But there is a way to find if you are looking at dust or ice, and this is when we use MCS profile, which is another instrument working around Mars. So on the left is the extinction from UVs versus altitude, which is the same here, extinction versus altitude for MCS. So here, this is our profile with the red is the average. We're at LS270, which is in perihelion, so atmospheric quite warm, and we expect a lot of dust at a latitude of 30 degrees, so in the north and southern hemisphere, which is we took the same LS a bit more restrained for MCS. And you can see that in green, you have the dust profile, and in blue, you have the water ice, in red, the aerosols, so when we addition both of them. And you can see that first you have a decrease here of the extinction that is mainly due to the dust, which is what we find also here in our profiles. And after the, here, the layer that you can see here or here are due to the water ice, which carries the layer that we see here. So even if we don't know from spectra that we are what we are looking for, when comparing to other instruments, for example, MCS, we know that this part is due to dust and this part is due to water ice. So this is how we, in some case, are able to know if we are looking at water ice or dust, which are very important. So finally, this is the climatology that I made. So we processed more than 10,000 occultation for two and a half Martian years. So Martian years 34, 35, and 36. Here is the LS. So the season with here when it's very cold and here when it's very warm at the perihelion versus altitude. Here on the left is the extinction. On the right is for the size. So there is a lot of information and try to show you what is interesting. So first, what's very interesting in here. So if, when you look at here, you see that you have dust extinction at more than 80 kilometers. 
And if you look to machine 35 or 36, actually it's not. It's always contained below 80 kilometers. When you look at the size, it's the same. You see that there is quite large particle, so large particles like one, one micron, which for us is quite large. But if you look to other year, actually it's not, it's much lower, especially here at 60 kilometers. So what happened in this March 44 at this time was of course a global a global dust storm as the one I, pre I presented before. This is what happened in May 28 on Earth and just after. You see that the whole planet is covered in dust. And actually when this happened, you find dust at very high altitude and we see it actually here. This is what this is why in March 34 we we're able to see dust at very high altitude is because of the phenomena. So we see it, which is good. But if you go more into the details, so now I select the southern region. So for latitude, only from one, minus 70 to minus 30. And you can see that, of course, there is much less data, but it's interesting because you see here a very nice decrease of the extinction when you are in aphelion. So Mars is getting colder and colder and you have aerosols and especially dust that will stay more to the ground. And it's, it's really made of very small particles. You can see here it's there is a particular super small, like 0.24 micron. So closer you go to the surface, the higher it is. And this phenomenon can be seen in machine 35, minus 66. It's almost the same. There is a bit of, of course, of uh, particles at a higher altitude. And this is probably clouds, even if we can't differentiate between dust and ice. The fact that you see smaller aggregates really at small detached layer at 60 kilometers, probably made of ice. So this decrease of extinction is interesting, but also when you look on the other side, perihelion, first you see particles at higher altitude because it's warmer, but you still see that the size increase a lot. So here at 40 kilometers, you have size that are more than, more than micron size particle, which is very large. And if you compare to this, you can see it's, the extinction also increase. While you are here, we don't have data. It's not because our which are failed, it's because the atmosphere is so thick that we don't have signals. So actually this means that there is here a lot of dust, probably, or aerosols that we are not able to see the ground. So it's actually quite interesting. And finally, when you go here, you can see that even if the extinction is not, it's not very clear, the size of the particles are very large, especially at this region. So if you just look before, is quite mixed with large particles here, and the more you go up, the lower it is. But here it's very large, and because this happened at this time, a regional dust storm. During this dust storm, the large particle will go at very high altitude, much higher than what it's supposed to be. I mean, here you can see micron sized particles at more than 40 kilometers. In Machine 34, it's also the case. So that's also a way that you can detect the storm even if we cannot know spectrally. So when you are here, so we see this, but so here, if you remember, I just saw that there was a lot of large particle, but when you look at all the region together on Mars, you see that it's not that large. And that's because we have to go to the Northern region where as opposed to the Southern region, if you go, if you look at here, there is only small particle in the perihelion. So when it's supposed to be warmer, and on the opposite, you have larger particles in the aphelion. So this, these differences are important to take into account. But it's interesting to see that when you look at the extinction profile, so the opacity, you see here a detached layer. So it can be the same in Machine 36, and it's also be here in Machine 34. What I mean is that if you look at the lower attitude here, you have larger extinction, it's going lower, lower, lower. And here, there is an increase again. You can clearly see around 60 kilometers. So we suppose that this is a, a cloud. And this cloud seems to be made of very thin particle. So and when you look in the, into the literature, actually, it is expected to see on Mars in the northern hemisphere. So this is where we are. At perihelion, thin waterized cloud. So that's why we, the hypothesis that what we see actually here is this waterized cloud, and it's made of very thin particle. So Everything is good. We don't see things that don't exist. But it's really interesting to see that the behavior is very different from the northern hemisphere from the southern hemisphere. And is, of course, depending on the season. And then finally, here, yes, you can see it's still, even if it's still at low altitude compared to the perihelion, is a particular very large. 
So this is what we see here and here to explain that where here is the, because here is the average between the large and small particle when we are together. And so finally, but there is still some part that we didn't explain. And for example, this part here that was there. So now if we look at the equatorial region, you can see that here, there is actually also detached layer with large particles between 40 and 20 kilometers. And you can also see them in extinction here. Uh, actually, it's something that I already presented before, because what we see is actually this cloud belt, this is called the Aphelion cloud belt, which is present in the Aphelion and also around the equator. It's a water ice uh, cloud belt that is already seen by previous work. And we, we can actually see it because it's here at 30 kilometers, an increase of extinction made of large particles. So we see here, this on the picture, and you can see it in our work, which is good also. So, And it's also present in Martian year 36 and 35. This is a regular phenomenon on Mars. It's not surprising to see it. So yeah, and so finally, so when we look to all this region, we can see pretty much different uh, things. You can see, so here's the Aphelion cloud belt. You can really see the decrease of the extinction in the particle. Here in the perihelion, you have to be careful when mixing all the latitude, but on average, the particle are, go to higher altitude and they are large. And you can clearly see the dust storm here that we presented before, just the side that are very, very strong in all the Martian years. So this storm seems to happen in Martian years. And so finally, I also want to talk a uh, link between water vapor and aerosols. On the left is the latitude versus altitude profile of water vapor coming from our Kietal 2022. So they retrieve water vapor using the NOMAD SO channel, which is another channel of the instrument in the infrared. And what is important to see is here, you can see that this is in between LS 318 and 333, which is during the dust storm, the late dust storm that we present before. And you have water vapor up to 80 kilometers, a bit below maybe 70, 75, with very strong concentration. When you look at here, so in Martian year 34, at the same time, we see at 80 kilometers that we have a detached layer here in green, actually. You see like, so it's going up, it's decreasing here, which will be just above this uh, water vapor. So one of the explanations that we can give that maybe the water vapor actually went above the hydropause and because of the temperature, it froze and actually creates this water rise that we can see actually here. When we look at just after that, so the water vapor decreases, it's not more than 80 kilometers, it's now at 60 kilometers. And the dust, so or the aerosols, are below 40 kilometers. So one of the explain that the dust storm is not here anymore. So because it's not here, the atmosphere is not warm enough to bring particles to higher altitude. And then the water vapor cannot freeze anymore. So that was, we don't see a cloud above water vapor here. So there is probably a link between the water vapor and the water ice, which makes sense. And by maybe looking at water vapor, we can also find some water ice cloud. So yeah, so just finally to summarize our work, in the UV, you cannot differentiate between dust and ice from spectra, but you can use other methods by looking at other instruments on other parameters. We saw that there are a lot of seasonal and latitudinal variation for aerosols. So the, in the, during the dust storm, you can, uh, they can be detected or by the fire that they bring aerosols to very high altitude or by the fire that you see much larger particles. And finally, we found some link between water vapor and aerosols. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I have several questions, but I will let other people talk. Uh, so my first question is uh, for the assumption uh, you use to derive the uh, particle size, you assume a fixed variance yes. of 0.1. Have you done other, uh, have you tested other values for these variants? Because yes. So we see yeah. changes. Yes, of course. So at first we use as a free parameter, but the issue that when we look at our vertical profile of size, it gives some unrealistic uh, distribution. 
So because when there is, so when the effective variance was too big, we were fitting very small particles. So for example, because if you use a 0 0.1 micron particle, so very small one with a huge variance, of course, the fit will be very flat, almost like a large particle with a small variance, which is not something realistic. So we made several sensitivity study, and yet we choose to fix to one variance because it gives us the best distribution and the best vertical profile. So, but of course, other value or maybe a bit more can be used, but we choose to stop at it there. Can you just um, tell us the local times so of your um, observations during the planet encircling the storm of Martian year 34, please? Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, just if you can tell us the range of local times you have during the uh, global storm of Martian year 34 so, for your observations. So because we're in circulation, our observations are in the terminator. So it's all the morning or the evening, but I didn't put a difference. Uh, do you do you have a, do you have a profiles in the morning and yes. in the evening? And do you observe a change in the altitude of the of the dust between morning and evening? So we don't have many profiles actually. Like I mean, at the same time, morning and evening. So I was not really able to have enough profile to be to say that there is a difference. That, that was a result that came out of a Mars Climate Sounder and they, they were observing this very, uh, very large difference in altitude between day and night uh, during the storm. But it but would be in, nice to, to compare. But yeah, but don't have, have, I don't have enough data to really make something to be confident you. in. Thank you. I, I am wondering uh, why the detached dust layers um, occur in Mars year 35 perihelion and not in 34 and 36. Some um, opinion on that? Sorry, which detached layer? Dust layers at mid altitudes like, um, like 40 kilometer, maybe in your slide 23. 20. So you're talking about. Are we talking? Uh, sorry. Are you talking about this one? Uh, uh, yeah, so maybe it would be more clear. So this one happened actually in here also in machine 33, 35, and 34. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it is highly, highly, because in my data, I don't know, but this is very, very probably a water ice cloud. It's present here, here, and here. Enough. Yeah, but well, maybe, but not this cloud seems to be every year. Hold on these profiles a bit. Um, you said uh, in your latest. Uh, that for the clouds, you are not seeing them. Uh, you are not seeing them uh, after the global storm. Ah, yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yep. Um, and I'm not sure. So here, if there is no spot, it's like you have no observation. Will you observe nothing? So here, I observe nothing. Okay. Like zero opacity. Zero opacity. Like the atmosphere is clear. Like okay. there is nothing. But yeah, but as you see, we have water vapor. So if the temperature and the storm was there, then maybe it could go higher and condense into water ice, and we would see something. But here we don't see anything. The atmosphere is very clear. All the particles are too small for our sensitivity. I have a suggestion for these plots because it's following following up uh, uh, Antoine's questions. Because sometimes you know when we see no data, I mean when we see no colors, we we interpret as like oh there are no data, and it's important to know that there are data but you don't see anything. So maybe you put put like gray yeah, put, symbol or whatever. Put some gray stuff, yeah. 
be very helpful. Yeah, no, it's like not a good mobile data. I just don't see anything. That, that's that's a that's a result per se, right? Yeah. Above, you always have data because you start at the very top of the atmosphere and you get down. It's just at the at the uh, in the in the bottom. Then maybe you don't have. Fun. You have measurements, but maybe it's too opaque and you don't. You cannot see anything. But above, it means you have nothing. Yeah, you detect nothing. Detect I mean, nothing. you have you have measurements, but a blank. Yeah, but you're right. It, Probably put another color saying there is a zero uh, would would help. Um, one last question: When you compare to MCS, uh, have you done comparison? during the affiliate cloud belt because um for the tropics this is a season where, so this is like in the dusty season but um in the affiliate cloud belt uh, period um you have this huge uh, interfacing between yes. water ice clouds and dust and even in MCS rituals, it's not always so easy to decipher from the two. So, have you looked at that? Uh, not yet, no. I have a question slash comment in uh, the chat from Hugh. Uh, so, he says, thank you. Nice to see your work. Question, with respect to your UV data, do you have a way to look at simultaneous radio wave delay propagations between brackets occultations? It could be a way to detect water vapor plus potential solid and liquid water. You could then discriminate UV seen with dust and dust slash ice. So, uh, so the question is to use radio occultation to distinguish them. So, yeah, no, 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 no. I know I'm just thinking, so I don't know if it's possible, but yes. So, but I mean, because for well, now we can't, but my goal is to use infrared to refresh between dust and ice. But if it's possible in radio occultation, we can also look into it. And then that, so the, the nice thing with NOMAD is that we have simultaneous measurement in the UV and the There would be, that's, it's not easy, but way to distinguish it. Yes. Anything else? Thank you, Zachary.